The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. <laughs> Kings podcast and I'm Max George. People think of podcasts as these beings invading our planet in some great cataclysm, destroying monuments, stealing our natural resources. But it's not like that at all. The invasion already happened. Bum bum bum. Nathaniel is not here on the episode, so I have full reign. So I hope you are all ready for a treat because I have a very, very special guest today for the podcast ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between i proudly to announce quite possibly my favorite guest we've ever had the one and only eric george (laughs) hi eric hey everybody um it's a pleasure to be here on the podcast with you max i am glad that i should and uh am your favorite guest it's exciting (laughs) we should probably tell people why you're my favorite guest uh everyone who is fan of the podcast you know that i have a few siblings eric happens to be my younger brother um a huge supporter of the podcast an avid horror movie fan as well uh, it's gonna be fun the george boys have taken over the podcast oh yeah let's keep it going like this <laughs> nathaniel you're out uh, out buddy get out of here <laughs> Everyone, Nathaniel has been having quite the last few weeks. Uh, His microphone went out, and then he had to do some home makeover stuff. So he has been back and forth in and out of his office, and we really wanted to get an episode out for Halloween. We did our epic annual two-year Halloween Horrorween movie marathon. Uh, We started watching horror movies around 10 o'clock and went until about 11 midnight, and it was great fun. We wanted to do a little recap of all of that, but fortunately, Pazuzu and his technology-destroying ways have changed our plans. So, Eric's on, helping us out. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Again, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, the Scream Kings. So, as always, when we have guests on the show, uh, we usually like to start with, how did you get into horror, Eric? I'm wondering if it's similar to kind of how I got into horror, where we have the same mom and she's super into all the supernatural paranormal kind of stuff yeah i i remember as a kid growing up watching a few different shows um the one that comes to mind is um the sixth sense is one i think watching it in her bedroom one night when we were very little i probably would have been around six at the time but uh the one that really really comes to mind is watching um signs at a friend's house you know we were all about nine or ten um, trying to be the big macho men we were at 10 years old um, and trying to freak each other out. And uh, Signs, uh, it came out in 2002. So, uh, you know, at that time, we, we would have been pretty young and uh, freaked out is what really kind of did it for me, which is the, the great thing with Dark Skies that we're going to review here today. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. it, it all kind of pulls the, uh, you know, full circle. Yeah, it was interesting to see that in our notes. Uh, Today, we're going to be reviewing the movie Dark Skies for anyone who didn't understand where that quote was when I started the show out. And Eric, you and I have always kind of really loved aliens. We both went to space camp. We've always been interested in outer space and especially aliens in particular. So that's cool that uh, Signs was really your first one. Yeah, that's the one I can remember the most. And then it, it brings back memories of you and other friends in the neighborhood trying to scare me with Aliens. (laughs) (laughs) Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had one friend in particular. I think this worked better with our younger sister, but I would dress up in this very metallic golden black kind of robe thing and had this alien mask. And we would run across the backyard and try and get people's attention of, oh, there's aliens in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a good time. Good time. <laughs> uh, so you started out with signs. I mean, that's an epic movie to kind of dive into horror with. But why do you like horror in particular? You know, for me, it's all about the catharsis and 
kind of the suspense, that feeling of excitement. But I don't even know if I know this question or the answer to this question. Yeah, you'd think we would as, as much as we're watching stuff and talking about it. But uh, my the reason why I like horror is I think along the same path. You know, it, it's a very different and unique genre in its own sense, where a lot of the more kind of pop culture, modern movies, and just all the other types of genre uh, movies out there all kind of feel the same. You know, horror is something that's going to pull out deep feelings and phobias and, you know, the, the whole intense sort of fear that is all built in within us that we all kind of crave, right? You know, I, I'm not going to go to any of these new Avenger movies and, you know, think about it much later after the movie has ended, but for a horror and any of the horror genres or subgenres, you know, that's going to stick with me if it really, really scared the pants, you know, off of me, right? So I think it's pretty similar to how you're feeling, but I, I really like horror um, in that sense. I'm notorious for watching horror by myself, um, as you are too. It's like we're crazy, uh, but my wife doesn't enjoy watching horror films. Um, you know, she, it's not her thing, but I have been seen and caught multiple times just sitting at home, all the lights off by myself, watching as many horror films as I can. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. I, I think there is something deeply ingrained in us when it comes to horror, when we are confronted with our fears and something that scares us, it really can last with us and not knocking any, you know, amazing dramatic motion picture at all right but if you have a well-developed horror movie that is telling a very good story it can really touch in on some of the darker things of life that other movies can't exactly um and we've talked about that a lot on the podcast so that's good to hear um all right so let's cut the crap what is your <laughs> favorite horror movie of all time you'd have to say Oh, you know, this one's a hard one to answer because it changes so frequently. Um, if we're being completely honest, I really, really love the the classic 80s horror films, particularly because they they had to work with what they had, right? We didn't have a ton of crazy computer CGI, you know, none of this kind of crappy, not necessarily crappy, but more unbelievable scares, if that makes any sense. So, yeah, I mean, we often say that uh, the 80s was a golden age of horror because there's just so much coming out from the 70s and they, they didn't have the CGI. They didn't have all that crazy stuff to work with. They really had to do what they could. Yeah. And uh, looking into some of the, you know, the trivia and stuff, a lot of the reactions were actual reactions to, you know, props coming down on uh, actors and you know, whatever they had, it felt and feels like a real reaction. If I had to pinpoint one of my favorite 80s horrors would be, you know, the, the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, it's the one that always comes to mind, along with a few of the others. Um, you know, The Thing. Um, I can't remember if The Fly is straight out of the 80s or a little bit later. Uh, the Fly is much earlier than the 80s. Is it? That one's also fantastic. But, uh, yeah, just overall, the... Uh, the eighties horror flicks are very, very impactful to me because of the practical effects. So I do have to clarify, there is a 1958 film, the fly, uh, but then it's just one of those classic movies that gets redone many times. So there is one that was made in 86. Ah, that's the one I'm thinking of with uh, Jeff Goldblum, right? Yes. Yes. That's the one. Awesome. So uh, it's curious to me that you think Nightmare on Elm is so good just because our mother was deathly terrified of anything <laughs> Freddy Krueger related. And so for me, when I first saw Nightmare on Elm, I was an adult because Freddy was just so banned um, in our house growing up. Our mom refused to let us watch it, refused to even like walk by his cardboard cutout once in a party store. I don't know if you remember that, but that just always stuck out with me. So when I first saw Nightmare, I, there was this taboo kind of related to it. You know, I, I was a grown-ass adult but thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, if mom finds out I'm watching this, I'm in deep shit. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think that kind of adds to the mystery and the horror of it all. So it was cool to see that that was one of your favorites. Yeah, it, it's always one that stands out. Um, in your notes, I see what your the scariest horror movie you've ever seen, and this get, has me excited because I think I recommended this show to you. 
Well, we watched it together. So okay, that, I, I wasn't yeah. sure if or if I did or not. So, talk to us about your the scariest horror movie. Yeah, this always changes too. But the the last several years for me have been kind of a bummer when it comes to horror, thriller, scary movies, right? But uh, I can't remember when it was a couple months ago that we we got together with your boyfriend and we had a little you know movie marathon that we we don't get to do much anymore. Um, but the one I chose here is my scariest horror film that has stuck with me since we've watched it is The Loved Ones. Um, it's the, I believe it's the Australian horror flick with, um, heavy influence with, um, a lot of the, you know, the popular modern serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and a few, you know, Ted Bundy, you can see a little bit of that in there. Um, uh, mainly Jeffrey Dahmer and some of the sinister things he did to his victims. Well, and um, especially Ed Gein, you know, it's this kind of murder uh, yeah. house type of a, a vibe. Yeah, murder house and just, it. it's pretty messed up. If any of your listeners haven't seen it, they should, but definitely, like, it's gold not, star it, movie in horror film. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not for the faint of heart at all. It's, yeah. it's brutal. It's yeah. very brutal. It's pretty, They're, pretty gnarly. There are several scenes that even a, a veteran horror, you know, critic like myself is kind of uh, unnerved watching. <laughs> yeah. It, it's good. It's really good. It definitely is. Top one that I've seen in a long time. All right. Anything else you want to talk to us about? Why you like horror? Any other good movies you've seen? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, there hasn't been a ton that I've been really thrilled about the past little while. There's a few that uh, have come out this year I haven't seen. And then a couple coming out soon that I'm excited to to hopefully catch and watch. Which ones are those? Um, so the one I haven't seen yet is the, uh, I guess the sequel, as you guys put it, um, which I didn't really understand, but was Candyman. Um, I haven't seen that yet, unfortunately. I need to put it on my little Plex server and watch it. And then the one that I'm really excited about coming out here soon is Antlers. That one yes. looks really, tr like, weird. And kind of crazy. Um, we did recently watch um, last night in Soho. Um, Ooh, I'm gonna this go week. see that this weekend. It's it's really good. I didn't go in with many expectations, so I didn't, you know, I didn't have anything set in my head as to how good or bad it was gonna be. And it had some good twists. You know, I was I was pretty happy with it. Overall, it seemed like it holds its own in in kind of a a different style of horror film it's kind of a horror thriller um kind of mystery type deal of what's going on i don't want to shoot out too many spoilers for you awesome well eric thanks again for being on the show should we dive into the movie we're gonna kind of pick apart today yes let's go ahead and get started all right so as we said earlier eric and i are both huge kind of alien aficionados whether we believe in them or not um, we had a, a fun episode quite a while back with a few colleagues of mine where we discussed the great alien debate. Um, and the movie we want to talk about today is Dark Skies. Uh, it came out in 2013, so it's relatively new, but kind of getting to the... I mean, once you pass a decade, it starts to be an old movie, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's directed by Scott Stewart. It's also written by Scott Stewart. He actually wrote the screenplay in about six weeks. Uh, this is a pretty uh, basic, straightforward alien movie, um, and we'll get into you know why it works and why it doesn't. But overall, you have this family who mom and dad are having some drama. They're struggling a little bit. The the dad is unemployed, so they're trying to make ends meet, and they have two adorable little boys. One who's on the cusp of being a teenager, and the other who's much younger. Uh, and as the plot and the movie move forward, we we notice these weird things happening, of course, to the house. Uh, and it's definitely not any sort of ghost, poltergeist, or demon. It definitely feels alien in nature. Uh, you know, if there are specific burns, and the the furniture all orients itself in a very specific way, and uh, all the birds kind of migrate to the house and. As I'm saying this out loud, this all feels very <laughs> much like demonic possession, uh, which would be an interesting thing to di dissect one day, is why, what makes an alien abduction different from demonic possession to some extent? Uh, 
more or less, uh, we realize that it is aliens who are attacking this family, and for a long time we think they're after the younger brother. Um, but then right at the end, there's this big, huge reveal, and we realize that it's the older brother who is the target of aliens. Um, and overall, it, it doesn't really, you know, change the alien genre in any severe way, uh, but it's a solid movie. Um, and the first thing I have kind of written down on our list is in regards to alien movies, I feel like this is very grounded. Um, it's based in reality, and a lot of the events that are happening are set in that kind of realistic uh, feel to it. A lot of times when you watch alien movies, they almost have a mysterious aura kind of permeating through the entire movie. Uh, like uh, The Fourth Kind we've reviewed on the show, that one feels very magical and almost occulty to some regard. Uh, and that, I think, disservices the aliens to some extent. And I like this movie because it just kind of breathes. It lets you live a life with these individuals and just move forward. Uh, it's more about them as a family than I think it is about the alien abductions. How about you, Eric? Yeah, I, I think it is um, a very well-rounded, kind of grounded um, alien movie. Uh, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about that kind of sets the, the movie running is the quote at the very beginning that kind of puts you in an unsettled mindset, which then just unrolls the rest of the movie. That quote is um, it's from Arthur C. Clarke, but the quote is, Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Uh, and growing up together, messing with each other with aliens and whatever, right? the thought that we either are or are not alone is still so terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so that quote mixed with the movie here um, as the very first thing we see on screen puts you in a mindset that is going to be like, okay, what the hell's going to happen? Especially if you've seen the trailer, it doesn't give away very much. There's some subtle hints to what may be happening, but as far as that, that's all you really know. Um, and so that, that quote, man, is just, it's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> well, and I think that kind of leads into the storytelling of this movie because it is, like I was mentioning, set in realism. Um, and as I was explaining what the aliens were doing, it does feel like demonic possession. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of times where the movie tries to and does a pretty good job at making you believe that, well, maybe this family is just a little crazy. Maybe it isn't aliens at all. Uh, and there's even a point where we think that perhaps the parents are abusing the children physically. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it plays on all of these strings that really make you second guess the plot and what's going on, which is, it's pretty cool. It, it stays very solid in its storytelling. It's not all about the aliens. It's not all about the family. It kind of pulls you along with these strings and lets you think about what's going on. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's a you know it's kind of a a mystery as the whole thing's going going through and you know the screen time's running. I think it was pretty interesting too because the the drama that was occurring between the father and the mother really was a forefront in the plot telling. Uh, there was stress, of course, in this household, and that stress and that anxiety definitely bleeds over to children. We all know this, and so. From a psychological point of view, you could imagine that, okay, maybe these kids are just reacting to this extreme stress that's going on in the home. Uh, the younger brother even contemplates if their parents are getting divorced at one point. And it made the anxiety of the aliens, of the, the real problem going on, a little bit more intimate. It made you really care for these two boys. Uh, there's a cute scene where they are talking via walkie-talkies about the Sandman. Uh, the little boy doesn't want the Sandman to come and pull his eyeballs out. Uh, and it, it's this macabre moment where they're talking about this terrifying Sandman figure uh, who happens to be the aliens overall. Uh, but their their sincerity and their innocence really comes through and they're just brotherly love. It's kind of a, a good movie for two brothers to be talking about to some regard. <laughs> It is, yeah. It's very interesting. I actually have some trivia about that specific scene here, Max, if you wanted to, to take a second and talk about it. Sure. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, 
So let's see. I'm just rereading it real fast. Um, so Sam, as you mentioned before, he's he describes these aliens as a Sandman um, and almost has an, an imaginary friend who visits him at night. Um, and if if your listeners didn't know, Sandman is actually a mythical creature or character in Western and Northern European folklore, um, equivalent to Morpheus in the Greek mythology, which yeah. you probably already know. <laughs> yeah, the, but, the uh, god of sleep and dreams. Yes, god of sleep and dreams. Um, and you know, with with him using his special sand, right, sprinkle it in the eyes of his his people. Um, but actually, for the Spanish dub, Sandman was translated simply as El Fantasma, uh, which is the ghost. Um, and that's because Sandman is totally unknown in Spain. Uh, interesting kind of little tidbit there. Yeah, again, this this idea that these brothers are subjectively trying to understand what's going on, again, is is based in realism. Uh, that these aliens, we can't quite understand what they are. Therefore, let's incorporate them into other ways that these kids can understand. Uh, another thing I really liked about this movie is the actual abduction process. Sometimes when we get into alien movies, it all just kind of happens all at once and it goes so fast and you're like, wait, what the hell? Uh, but this movie, it, it does kind of play on a haunting element. But it, the, the abduction is slowly happening. You almost get the feel that the, the aliens are watching this family and kind of evaluating them as time goes on until they finally decide to do the abduction. And, and I thought that was very important in an alien abduction movie i need to kind of slowly watch the gradual descent into the abduction mm -hmm. i think i think there's good in like a sudden quick jarring abduction abduction uh, i just haven't quite seen that done very well in other movies what did you think i think it, it's very unnerving how slow they did um did those abductions because it, it does play into the fact that it may be something demonic at play um during the the running time, you know the the parents start kind of bickering about if one of them is is abusing the kid or you know and the the dad has lost his job and there there's a lot of this kind of unnerving sense that the kids are being abused but the the length of the abductions is very different than what we normally see, um, and from researching a little bit earlier today these abductions in the movie are actually based off. Um, some real reports that people have given. I guess the you know the director, uh, what was his name, Scott Stewart, uh, Stewart, uh, did some research and maybe have asked around or you know looked at actual encounters of people you know telling the world that they were actually abducted, which is really cool. But it is so unnerving at the speed. <laughs> you know, it's like it makes you think. Have I been abducted? <laughs> you know, like I have weird marks on my body and I don't know where they came from. So possibly, I guess. <laughs> um, if you have, we need to have a different conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're saying all those encounters I had as a kid were actual abductions. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You get pretty bad migraines. Maybe that's just the aliens taking over. I do. It may be their microchip. Uh, yes. <laughs> activating and deactivating. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the better scary moments. There are not a ton, uh, but the scene that I always watch that really kind of gets to me is when the birds just randomly start flying into their house. Uh, the CGI and the physical effects here I thought were done very well. These birds, the ravens, crows, whatever they were, uh, just start pelting into the windows of the house and the windows start to get bloody and there's feathers everywhere. And then our main character kind of leaves the house. The ground is just littered with these dead birds. I don't know. There's just something really unsettling about that. There is. I, uh, I've watched that scene a few times today, and each time it's like, ugh. You know, birds are terrifying as is. And uh, it, it obviously has some nods, too, to, to previous horror films in the past. Alfred Hickok's, I believe, his The Birds, and then, you know, a few other, other uh, popular horror flicks. Yeah, and if you look at uh, real-life alien abduction lore, I mean, I say real-life tongue-in-cheek, uh, but you do see kind of animals reacting in a very interesting way whenever it comes to paranormal stuff. So Hitchcock aside, even this really plays into that. Yeah. 
Um, another really good scene that I liked is, of course, the uh, scene where we see this poor little kid, and he's just got these marks all over him. They're at the swimming pool. He doesn't want to get into the pool, and he's being a little shy about taking his shirt off, but the babysitter he's with finally gets him to take it off, and there are just these thick bruises all over his body. Um, and of course, we all will go straight to, oh, what if he's being physically abused? Which is what the movie wants you to think, too. Uh, of course, with the understanding that, well, it's really the aliens. Uh, but, but that's just such a real element to our lives that, you know, child abuse exists. And it's absolutely horrible in every which way. And so them taking that and kind of interjecting it into an alien narrative uh, it really is unsettling and you just it kind of breaks your heart even though you know it's aliens you're still just so sad and heartbroken about it yeah it uh it definitely puts a um you know a heartbroken manner in there because we were very focused on the two kids um for a good portion of the movie and then we can kind of see the 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 broken relationship between the parents um and we don't feel it's as bad for them you know these two poor kids could potentially get beat up, you know, and abused by their parents. And it, it is very, very sad to, to even think that is actually happening. Another really kind of unsettling moment for me is uh, when the older son, um, I'm going to try and grab his name, Jesse, I believe, is in the forest with his best friend. Um, and they're just kind of running around being boys. And then all of a sudden he just stops stares up into the sky and just like is paralyzed his mouth is open his body's kind of trembling uh it's really i don't know it's got under my skin quite a bit this poor kid being paralyzed looking up into the sky yeah it's uh i think the sense of not being able to kind of control what's happening you know in that in that part of the movie would be terrifying to to experience on your own for sure yeah. Any other scary parts that you thought about? Um, there's one that we don't have here on the notes, and it's where the mom, I think they're trying to sell the house, or they have someone coming, neighbors or someone in the house, and she's talking to them. And then she also has her own kind of freaked out experience where she just like stops talking to them, um, turns around, and then starts banging her head against the window, mm. you know, in an uncontrollable manner, which... You know, it would not be fun to one experience and watch someone do that, and then, you know, it's just the whole the whole idea of the uncontrollable, uh, you know, something or other that's happening to you and your family. And that scene itself, just her banging the head into the glass. They don't take too many like precautions when she's doing that. It looks very authentic and scary. Yeah. All right. Overall, I, uh, you know, this, uh, this movie is solid. It's great. There, it's not perfect. Uh, the plot twist that we mentioned a little bit earlier, it, it's a fun little spin. I didn't really anticipate it coming when I first saw this movie. Uh, a second rewatch, though, if you watch it a second time, it's very clear that some, it, you know, it's not about the young kid. It's about uh, the older boy, Sam. Uh, did you see it coming when you first saw it, Eric? No, I think when I first watched it, um, I had no real idea what was happening until the very, very end. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't see the, the actual twist of the, the aliens wanting to take the older boy um, at all, from what I can recall. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's a fun twist, and I think it was pretty original, especially where the big reveal was moments before the movie was going to end. Uh, and that's another really positive thing i think about this movie is that the heroes the parents and the young boy don't win sam is abducted uh and it, it sets itself up for a a sequel but up to this point we don't have a sequel so in all reality they lost their child uh and i like that i like it when horror movies don't have this kind of happy good feeling ending uh, because that's kind of how life is it's not always you know rainbows and butterflies Right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, how devastating to the family and the viewers that this kid that we've kind of grown up, you know, he has his own little teenage experiences in the movie, just completely disappear with no no resolve in the end. 
and I, I've talked to a few people who actually ended up not liking the movie because of this moment, that it was just, they wanted that, you know, maybe not a happy ending, but they wanted the family to win out against the aliens, uh, and they don't, and I think that's kind of punk rock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, it works, it put me at an ease, so I guess they did their job. <laughs> All right, uh, let's maybe kind of go into a few things that were not so super positive about it. Um, and the first and foremost thing that I want to discuss is this movie is rated PG-13. Uh, fans of the Scream Kings are going to know that Nathaniel and I don't... Uh, I mean, we enjoy PG-13 horror, but it's very, very rare to find a PG-13 horror movie that is that delivers on all fronts. Horror is just a type of genre that really needs to not have any boundaries or limitations for it to be truly effective. And when you stamp that PG-13 on it, it automatically kind of puts the movie in a box. You know that the scares aren't going to be super unsettling. Uh, you know the gore and kind of the horror elements are going to be censored in some regard. And so this movie is PG-13. Uh, it does deliver on many, many fronts, but I feel like had it been R, they really could have taken it to the next level. Uh, the whole child abuse thing could have been really explored in deeper ways. Uh, the aliens could have been a lot more threatening based on what they were doing. Uh, it, it just it opens it up for a lot more possibility. Yeah, I think I would agree, too. Um, I, I tend to stay away from PG-13 horror, too. The, the biggest issue I have is you can have a really good trailer that's like, oh, this movie looks uh, terrifying, right? And then as soon as the rating on the trailer comes out as PG-13, you're like, oh, I just saw all the scary parts. Yep. Uh, and it's like, <laughs> well, this is going to poop the bed. <laughs> you know, crap the bed, as Nathaniel would say. Ah, uh, he's going to be so happy that the saying has <laughs> continued. Yes, I will, I will respect his wishes, I guess. <laughs> I'm an avid fan. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you, you do put it in a box. It's like, okay, this, this may have some unsettling scenes, you know, and kind of make me think about it longer than I probably would any other movie, since it's a horror flick. But, in all reality... As much as PG-13 tries to push the R boundary now, like in modern horror film, uh, it's still just, it, it's steps below a rated R horror film, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah and, and not to like rag on every PG-13 horror movie that's ever been made. There's some really good ones out there. It's just difficult to really push boundaries in a PG-13 movie because you are constrained. You have those limitations. And there's a time and a place for that. Uh, a lot of times when it comes to horror, I feel like they throw that PG-13 on there to kind of reach a broader audience, which ultimately is about making money. Oh, totally. Uh, so you, you kind of have that at the back of your mind, thinking, well, they didn't go hard because they just want money. <laughs> yeah, they want to uh, uh, reach a better audience. I mean, you used to work in a movie theater. You should know all about this. Yeah, I was just about to share that experience. Um, so we we saw this all the time. You know, with any of the, I believe the Annabelle movies are PG thirteen, right? Maybe uh, no, most of them are R actually. Most of R. I can't remember which ones are, but we would see it. You know, as as work, a movie, you know, employee, movie theater employee, uh, there would be this big horror film especially around halloween season and then it would just flood the the most obnoxious <laughs> moviegoers they were all teens right they were all you know uh teenagers who wanted to go on a date night and scare their you know their their date and it was just a huge flood and i mean the the marketing works right if you can get kids and or not kids but teens and then anyone above that age interested in a horror film and slap that PG-13 label on it, you're going to make a lot more money than you probably would if it were rated R. Yeah, and I think PG-13 movie definitely has its place. I think, I keep saying the phrase, I think, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but they allow, it's kind of like a gateway drug, a gateway horror movie. Uh, we use that phrase a lot on Scream Kings, gateway horror. It allows young teens 
exposure into the world of horror, and that's important. We have to have movies like that. Uh, but something like Dark Skies, I just really think could have been enhanced had they just kind of pushed the limits and made it R. Yeah, I agree. Uh, another part that I really struggled with in the movie was when the parents finally go to seek help. They they realize that, oh, maybe this is aliens. And they go to a man named Pollard. And he is portrayed by everyone's favorite grumpy old man, <laughs> uh, J.K. Simmons, who's in quite a bit of stuff. And... This scene, I felt like, lasted 30 minutes. He was going over all of the different rules to alien abduction and the different types of aliens and how aliens abduct and how aliens dress and what color they paint their nails. And uh, I mean, that was a joke because it just, I don't know, he just won't shut up, I feel. The, the scene just goes on far too long. Yeah. Uh, there's some trivia about it. Uh, I don't think it's really that interesting. But uh, J.K. Simmons was cast at very short notice. So he came in, did his thing, and like bounced. But that whole scene was kind of like, do we really need this? Or is it just a way to, to extend the time of the show? <laughs> yeah, it, it just was exposition for exposition's sake. There, there felt no like real purpose behind it all. I, I think the movie would have been more scary had we not really known what was going on. Yeah. Um, and again, this movie, it wasn't super scary. Uh, there are moments that are unsettling and gross, but overall, it's not very spooky at all. Um, it does kind of feel more like a thriller, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's definitely a subgenre of horror. But again, I think because it's PG-13, it's limited in the scares that it can accomplish. Yeah, I think so, too. One thing that, that you know, is really big in, in this movie is this, the score and the soundtrack. A lot of it helps kind of play up, you know, these scares that are going to happen. There are a few that, you know, are totally out of, out of the blue. Uh, but there are uh, several jump scares that in my opinion, are kind of the easy way out, you know, especially when you're playing a score that it's kind of obvious that something's going to happen soon. So we all kind of expect it, um, you know, but a few jump scares, you know, to, to achieve a scare overall is fine, you know, is fine to happen. Yeah, I think jump scares serve a purpose. It's when a movie starts to rely on the jump scares to scare. Uh, that's where the issues start coming in. Right. Yeah, that's exactly where I, I'm kind of pointing to. And this one feels like they kind of leaned on those a little bit. Um, once they, they kind of established the unnerving sense of what's happening, then they were like, well, their people are already unnerved. So let's throw in several jump scares to just because. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, also with that, the acting for me was kind of hit or miss. Uh, there were some scenes that everyone did a really good job. Um, our lead protagonist uh, is Carrie Russell. She's a great actress. Um, and then her husband is played by Josh Hamilton, who's also, you know, well-established and a pretty well-known actor. Um, and they, they were fine. They weren't good. They weren't bad. They were fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were some lines that they delivered where it was like, okay, someone's acting. Um, but then Carrie Fisher in the scene where she's banging her head on the glass, that was really, truly scary. And so, uh, it just kind of was hit or miss. What did you think of the acting, Eric? Uh, I think about the same. And it's Carrie, you said Carrie Fisher, it's Carrie Russell. Oh my um, gosh. Well, <laughs> clearly it should have been Carrie Fisher. May she rest in peace. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think the, you know, out of the four main characters we see in the movie, Carrie Russell, um, who plays Lacey Barrett. Uh, in the the film was probably the strongest acting. I mean, it's hard to to criticize younger kids when they're acting, um, especially the youngest um, who played Sam. His name's Caden Rocket, looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was hit or miss. There were some really good parts, some other you know lines and um, things of dialogue that may have been a little weak in my you know my <laughs> mediocre opinion. Uh, the last two things I want to say, first and foremost, is that the ending was good. The plot twist was fun. It definitely uh, felt unique. 
but I thought the like ramp up to the end game of the movie was just kind of all over the place. Um, this family starts by having dinner together. They've built in all of this extra security to the house. They got a German shepherd dog to be an attack dog or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden the aliens start coming and it's just like game over real fast. There's not a lot anyone can do. Um, and so it kind of felt cheap. The movie was leading up to this really awesome, you know, almost battle scene with these aliens and the aliens just kind of pwned them. Yeah, it, it just, you know, it's over very quick. We have this full build up of like, all right, something's going to happen. And then you blink and it's over <laughs> with a, a fairly good twist. Um, and then the, the final thing is uh, I'm getting to the point with horror movies that the trope of, okay, I'm a dad. Um, we have a mom, you know, whatever. And our kids are going through something traumatic. They're acting weird. They're behaving oddly. They are drawing all these creepy pictures. And, like, there's this sense of disbelief. Like, the parents don't want to believe that maybe something's going on that they don't understand. Uh, and I get that. You want your kids to be normal or whatever. Uh, but it, the trope is kind of getting tired. Like, believe your kids. It's 2021. <laughs> um, <laughs> if they are telling you something is going on, whether you fully can understand what it is, listen to them. Like, be emotionally available for your children. I, I, I don't know. It it feels just... I, I'm over it. Like, if your kids are saying that they're seeing something or they're being visited by a guy in the night, like, let's, let's move along to therapy or let's go see a doctor or let's believe them. Uh, and, and they kind of allude to that in the movie. The husband, it's very aggressive that someone is coming into his house, but they can't afford for therapy but there's still this just sense of disbelief like oh the kids are just being kids uh i, I don't know am i making any sense eric yeah you definitely are um especially now in modern modern times you know we're 2021 where mental health and you know just just really being a good parent is becoming very prevalent right the the way the parents act in this film reminds me of the scene in Matilda <laughs> when her, her, her dad is, says the line, I'm smart, you're dumb, I'm big, you're little, I'm right, you're wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. Which is just a terrible way and a terrible thing to say to a child, especially when there's clearly physical evidence that something is wrong, uh, you know, in the kid. Just, just sit down, kneel next to him, whatever, hold your child. Uh, and listen to what they have to say, you know? It's... I mean, it, for me, it was the moment where all of the furniture all of a sudden gets stacked up on itself in an instant. And Carrie Russell's character is just like, oh, must be the kids. It's like, oh, yeah. it's not the kids. <laughs> yeah, like... uh, a six-year-old can't do that in five minutes. Come on. Yeah, yeah with the furniture and it's like all the, uh, um, the like canned goods and stuff. It's like, there's no way a kid, two kids, a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, or uh, the six-year-old, I think, the kid, the youngest kid is younger. I can't remember. Uh, there's no way they could have done that in a few, like, a matter of minutes. <laughs> and it's also, I just, this movie is grounded in realism, and I felt like one of these moments that kept happening about not believing in their kids kind of broke that. Uh, it's... It's again, I'm going to talk about hereditary because we're the hereditary fan <laughs> podcast. I was uh, waiting. <laughs> that movie and other movies like Loved Ones, even or Midsummer or anything for Jackson, the characters' motivations and decisions are realistic. They're like, look at anybody else in real life scenarios, they would probably do something similar. Uh, you know, not the same. It's horror movie, and we have to suspend our fantasy a little bit. But this movie, I don't know. If I was a parent and I had a kid who said the Sandman was coming to visit him every night and wants to gouge out his eyes, I would be much more concerned than either of the parents were in this. Yeah, so. it's pretty alarming to say stuff like that, especially as young as the kid was. Right, right. Well, anyway, that's my soapbox. I'm sure this <laughs> is going to come up again. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, that is Dark Skies. Uh, again, it's a solid movie. It's not perfect by any means. It doesn't come close to being perfect. It's a great, you know, you have a 
a partner, a significant other who doesn't love horror like you, Eric, I think mm -hmm. your wife could appreciate this movie. Uh, yeah. It's spooky, but not too spooky. <laughs> Definitely. We've uh we've actually watched it with my wife and her younger brother one night and he stayed up and watched the whole thing and I fell right asleep. So I guess that that says how well I think of this <laughs> now uh, after rewatching it a couple times. Uh but yeah, it's it's overall a pretty good movie. Definitely a kind of a gateway thriller uh horror film to uh, to introduce to to your skeptic uh kind of scaredy cat friends. <laughs> Horror movie virgins. Yeah. And we'll just sacrifice you for your blood. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about crowns and screams. You're familiar with our rating system, right, Eric? Oh, of course. Uh, so as far as screams on a scale of one to 10, how scary was this movie for you? One being it was a Disney film, 10 being it was hereditary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, Here on our notes, I put 3.5. Uh, and I don't know if I put it higher than than uh, maybe your score, just because we're brothers and we have to be better than each other. <laughs> but, uh, you know, talking about it now and looking into it a little bit further, it's really not that scary. There's a few jump scares. It's a little unsettling. However, I mean, I'm going to walk away from watching it another time without any, you know, sense of terror, um, sense of horror, you know, in the back of my head. Yeah, um, I gave it a, th a three. You know, there are moments where it's unsettling and spooky and gross, but overall, you're you're not going to have nightmares, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think Unless so either. Like a, a horror noob, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> a horror virgin. <laughs> yes! Um, all right, how about Crowns? What would you rate this movie on a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, so Crowns, I rated it a 5. Overall, it's an okay movie. It makes you think and kind of wonder what's going on. It does have a few scenes that'll make you jump. Uh, if you don't expect them. And then, you know, just the unsettledness of it uh, holds up. It holds up okay. Yeah, I gave it a four. Uh, again, like, solid movie. It's not bad. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's not perfect. Just kind of sit in the middle. Uh, it's fun. I usually watch it about once a year. Uh, just because it is a, a well developed and good quality alien movie and those seem to be few and far between yeah it's not very gimmicky and it's it's pretty different than what you'll you'll expect all right mr george uh anything else you want to say about dark skies um i don't believe so i think we've covered it pretty well all right well how are you staying spooky so I'm staying spooky in a couple ways most recently i finished um reading the troop Rather listening to it, I can listen to books and podcasts while I'm at work, which has been great. Um, but the the book it was um, the Troop by Craig Davidson, and you've also read this up camping with us before, uh, and it's it's a really good and uh, disturbing kind of novel. It put me on edge the whole time. I was getting upset when people were trying to interrupt me and make me actually work. Uh, <laughs> but the descriptions in the the book um, are very well planned out and like it's very vibrant descriptions and uh you know i could easily visualize what was going on um and it it brought me back to the times we were in our our scout troop too you know at overnights or scout camp and whatever and just you know the nonsense that went and happened there but uh if if anyone hasn't read it a little spoiler is uh, there's a parasitic plague going on you know, that was developed in a lab and, you know, it went completely wrong and it shows kind of the experiences and depicts those experiences in a scout troop setting. Uh, and it it's just a really great read, you know, visually uh, descriptive and, you know, really unsettling imagery uh, written throughout the book. Yeah, I liked when you said that it's a vibrant read because that really kind of defines a lot of the descriptions in it. Uh, they are very vibrant, and in a horror book, you want that. You want those unsettling images kind of in your head. Uh, and a funny, like, anecdote is I did read this up camping last year, and I finished it in, like, two days just because it is so gripping. And then all of a sudden, uh, my our sister wanted to read it, so she read it. And then I went home with you, and we found out that the book, like a parasite, had kind of made the rounds through everybody. 
Yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> is truly a testament to how good the book is. If you want a, a legit awesome horror book, check out The Troop. Definitely. Uh, another way I'm kind of staying spooky, and this is just me being me. If if you know Max will think this is funny, I hope. But I'm I'm soon to be a dad, and it's kind of scary to me. You know, <laughs> we're we're about to have our first kid here in uh, April, and I don't know what to expect. I'm a little, you know, nervous. But uh, I guess that's that's pretty spooky if it's your first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's great. I didn't think of it, but I fully understand it is its own kind of fear <laughs> yeah yeah definitely all right i am staying spooky with uh last night actually me and the boy we watched the most recent paranormal activity movie uh paranormal activity next of kin Ooh, uh, ooh and <laughs> it is the most uh, it's probably the least paranormal activity paranormal activity movie out there uh it tries to be like this mockumentary film but then it stops and it just goes into like a real movie, you know, the third person kind of shooting. Uh, but then it tries to go into like a found footage vibe. And again, it just kind of slips back. Uh, it goes back and forth, which is a little silly. Uh, the movie is not anything brilliant or amazing. Uh, but one of my favorite paranormal activities, actually, it's all about the demon Asmodeus. And he's probably my second favorite demon of all time. Uh, so I was excited about that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and it's pretty fun. You know, it's it's a good scary night movie. Movie, it's great. It's uh, streamable on Paramount Plus. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of this one. Uh, the Paranormal Activity, the first one, maybe the second one, are are kind of iconic. Uh, you know, back when they were released. But this one, I had no idea they were doing another one. Probably because I don't subscribe to Paramount Plus. <laughs> so that would explain that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I heard about this uh, via a podcast, another podcast I was listening to, and they dropped a little trailer for it. And I was like, oh, okay, I have Paramount Plus. I'll go check it out. Uh, the <laughs> other way I'm staying spooky is I was actually a guest on another podcast. Uh, one of our guests that we had early on in the show is named Brett. We did a classic horror movie review. Uh, we talked about Frankenstein, Dracula, the Mummy, Creature of the Black Lagoon, all of that. And he and his brother actually just started a new podcast called Silence is Golden. And they had me on for their Halloween episode. We talked all about Nosferatu and the amazing beauty that is that movie. And it was a great time. So if you are a fan of the classic horror movies and you just love podcasts, definitely go check them out again. Silence is golden. Very nice. And before we wrap up here, Eric, you have a few kind of artistic projects that you do. Uh, do you want to tell everyone what you do and where they can find you? Sure. So I, uh, I'm not super duper social media guy. I do have, you know, Facebook and Instagram, but I do have a little side gig where um, I do acrylic pour painting. Um, mostly on canvas, and then I've done a little side projects for myself on uh, records. Um, but it's just a, a simple, you know, art page that you can go check out. the The handle is at poured by George um, on Instagram, and then we have a, a page on Facebook, but it's not very developed. Um, and then we've we've done a few commissions for people. Um, I haven't done a ton with it the past little while. I do have a really cool uh, Majora's Mask from The Legend of Zelda uh, on there. That is the most recent thing I've done and painted. It's actually 3D, 3D printed is kind of the thing I'm into right now. Um, and merging kind of both those has been a really fun project. So you may see some cool stuff on there um, here in the future. But yeah, again, the, the handle is poured by George on Instagram. And then uh, you may be able to find that same page on Facebook. Yeah, definitely check him out. I've got actually some of your work hanging up on my wall. You, you do a good job. You and your wife have really, I don't know, it's cool art. And people should check you guys out. I mean, I'm your brother, so I am biased. <laughs> um, yeah. But check it out. You might find a good Christmas present for a loved one. Definitely. All right, everyone, that is our review of Dark Skies. Our next episode, Nathaniel will hopefully be back unless Pazuzu continues his possession. Uh, and if that is the case, I may have to go exercise him. So that will be a fun adventure that we will definitely record. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, everyone, stay spooky. 
Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreamKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Scream Kings. Stay spooky.